Guys, welcome to my new podcast, Getting Chatty with Platy. This is a long time coming, and the idea of this series is going to be a multi-platform series, sometimes uploaded as a YouTube, sometimes it's going to just be an IG Live, but we want to cut the shit from ordinary, mundane business, what's your best self-help book type podcast. This is going to be a conversation between one human being and another human being, both successful people, talking about life, talking about grit, getting into detail, and and just getting chatty and hopefully having a bit of a laugh. So this isn't just going to be online entrepreneurs, but this may be authors and people from all walks of life. I'm going to bring on some amazing guests for you. And we're going to kickstart this with an absolutely huge guest today, Neil Patel. And I'll go more on to an intro shortly. But before we do, guys, this is the first episode, okay? And I want to know from you what you liked about it, what you didn't like about it, anything you think we should change, anything we can improve for the future. The ball is in your court. I'm at your beck and call. I want to create the content that you guys are screaming out for. So please do let me know after watching this podcast today or listening to this podcast, what you would like us to change and maybe what you think would be fun to add in the future on Getting Chatty with Platy. So today I'm joined by Neil Patel, who's not only the co-founder of Neil Patel Digital, but also a New York Times best-selling author and an international speaker. He's also someone named by Forbes as one of the top 10 marketers in the entire world back in 2016. Now he has worked with an abundance of conglomerate companies within his marketing agencies such as Amazon, Google and Microsoft and his personal marketing blog receives over 3 million visitors every single month. Now many of you may know him from his YouTube channel where he shares marketing related content to over 700,000 subscribers. I think he's got over 30 million views which is absolutely bonkers. So I think it's fair to say that Neil is well qualified to be the first guest on Getting Chatty with Platy. Now, before I play this episode to you, I want to have a little bit of self-reflection. This is my first ever episode, the first time I've ever interviewed somebody that I didn't have existing rapport with, the first time I've ever recorded a podcast or done anything like this. And so in self-reflection and looking at this interview and watching it back, I need to ask more open-ended questions in the future because I seem to ask a lot of questions that can be answered very, very quickly and it very quickly turns into a question and answer session. Whereas my goal for getting chatty with Platy is a conversational platform, right? I want this to be a conversational series where we can have a laugh and we can really get into some deep conversation about topics that we are mutually passionate about. So that's kind of my reflection on this episode. I hope you get a ton of value from it. I'm sure you see, you will see uh, what I mean by that. And I'm really, really looking forward to looking back on this episode in the future to see how much I personally progressed as an interviewer and how much my skills have developed. So anyway, enough of me rambling about myself as an interviewer and as this first episode, I'm going to get straight into to this. Here is episode one. It's Neil Patel getting chatty with Platy. Cool. So Neil, thank you so much for joining us today. This is a big one for me as a marketer myself. I'm really, really excited to be getting chatty with you today. It's funny because I was doing some research this morning, a little bit of extra stuff, scrubbing up on stuff. And I read something uh, which was really interesting. I read that you were a bit of a rascal growing up that at 15 years old you started selling burned cds to friends is this true and then you progressed this enterprise to selling hacked satellite tv cards to classmates and their parents <laughs> i find that really really interesting i don't know why but you've clearly displayed this ability to be able to find opportunities from a very young age to obviously where you are now being worth tens of millions of dollars and so what i'd really love to know is what is it that people need to look out for? People who are watching this, who maybe are desperately looking for opportunities, what is it that people need to consider when they're trying to find opportunities in life? Well, the, the first thing is, is you gotta solve real problems. If you're not solving real problems, you're not gonna end up doing well in the long run. You know, it's just like, when people are looking for opportunities, they're like, where can I make a quick money? If people don't have that problem, and you have a solution, but there's no problem, then you're going to be selling something that people don't need. Mm -hmm. So the best place to look is what problems are people facing and how can you solve them? And ideally your solution needs to be easy to use and affordable. Okay. And if, if you can do those two things, that's great. And then the next thing I would really look for is, look, are you passionate? Because if you're not passionate, you're not going to put in the time and energy required to succeed in the long run. You got to keep pushing forward. You got to put in the time. 
you got to put in the energy. And if you don't do that, it's hard to succeed. Amazing. Thank you. And, and so you've, you've worked for your fair share of businesses and, and enterprises. Are you always following passion then over potential financial gain? Typically, yes. I, I, I solve uh, passion and not just passion, but passion and solving problems because those two combined typically cause a financial gain. Going after a financial gain doesn't mean you're going to make money. There's so many people out there who want to make money. Just saying, I want to make money, I'm going to do whatever it takes, doesn't do crap for you. you got to really solve problems that a lot of people face. 100%. I couldn't agree more with that. I've, I've found, certainly in my own life, that uh, the, the initial goal for me was always, okay, I want to pursue money and I want to find money. And that was kind of the, the superficial idea of what success actually is. And then you get a little bit behind you and you realize that those materialistic things or having that cash in the bank doesn't really do an awful lot for you in the grand scheme of life. And so I think it's really important for anybody listening to this, that following your passion is, is really important. And you found your passion in marketing and have become, if, if not the most influence influential or well-known name in the marketing space um and so what was it that progressed you to, to stumbling across marketing did it just so happen to did you just so so happen to stumble across marketing one day or was there a, a natural progression to finding that that proper passion there was a natural progression see a lot of people find their passion not because they grow up being like i want to be a firefighter i want to be a doctor i want to be a policeman they or policewoman um, they grow up, they think these things, but then as they get older, they find that they don't want to do any of them. And then they tend to be lost and not sure what they want to do. But that's normal. That's actually the majority of people. So what tends to happen is you try stuff and eventually it leads you down a path of what you're naturally better at, what you enjoy, what you're passionate about. For example, I started a job board. I got no visitors to my job board. I paid some marketing companies. They didn't do well. I lost my money. So I had no choice but to learn how to do it. And as I started doing it, I fell in love with it and that became my passion. Amazing. I love that. And, and you and talking of the passion, I mean, you're, you're putting out so much content at the moment. I mean, you, you put me to shame in what content you're putting out there. And so I would love to dig a bit deeper, probably rather selfishly into what your, your, your content strategy is like at the moment. How are you churning out so much content? Now, presumably you have a team who are doing this for you, but what does that look like if you don't mind revealing that for us guys? Sure, so right now, what it looks like is I write blog posts myself. On top of that, I have an editor, Kelsey, and a team of people who help as well. And they'll crank out like the mundane content such as like, how to set up conversion tracking in Google Analytics, right? Like the boring mm -hmm. stuff that doesn't require um, a ton of personal experience or anything like that. And then I'll crank out the ones that are more related to my experiences, what I've seen, mm -hmm. uh, and things like that. But the process is breaking down based on content that is experience-based or just mundane stuff like how to do a 301 redirect, right? Because some mm -hmm. people are looking up for basic information and for those content pieces, other people can help write them on my team and then I'll write the stuff that requires the life experiences. Okay. And are you creating one large, like larger pieces of content such as the blog and then dissecting individual smaller pieces across your other platforms? For example, you're posting quite regularly on, I mean, your YouTube channel, but also Instagram and Facebook and all these micro pieces of content as well. So are you adopting a model where you're dissecting smaller parts of much larger content that you're producing on the top end yeah so so my model is i i just blanket the web with content that people search for so mm -hmm. i use tools like uber suggest look at keyword volume and then i just blanket the web with anything someone's searching for related to my space that's a real strategy yeah okay sweet and that's that's actually similar to how i'd launched my youtube channel and i preach that all the time is that finding that what people are searching for i often say that look at the, what your competitors uh, their their followers are actually posting in the comment section and what they're asking for their for your competitors to actually create content about and it's usually the content that they are afraid that is too valuable to actually put out which then paves the way for someone else to come across and actually create that content that everybody is actually screaming for and desiring so 
Um, and so you're using, what, what tools are you using? You said you're using, uh, which SEO tool was that that you're using to find search results? Uber suggests. And uh, I use that for YouTube as well because the Chrome extension gives you all the YouTube data. Amazing. Is that your company, Uber suggests? Yeah. <laughs> Convenient. <laughs> Build the tools that you need the most. Definitely. Okay. Why not? <laughs> Love that. Um, Neil, I, was, I created a YouTube video, which I, I, I uploaded yesterday and actually uh, today. Um, and I was talking about the future trends of digital marketing and where this industry is going. And I don't think there's many people out there more qualified to, than you to talk on the topic. And I'd love to know from your perspective, I'll highlight a few of the ones that, that I mentioned in there shortly, but I would love to know if there are any trends right now or things to look out for in the coming years that marketers really need to be mindful of and start adopting. Um, and mainly just so you've got some background, the majority of my audience are agency owners, marketing agency owners. And so, yeah, what are the trends that you think that we should keep our ears to the ground on right now? Yeah, so, uh, and just in general for all marketing, correct? Yes, correct. So the big trend that I see right now that very few people are paying attention to is voice. Now, according to Comscore, 50% of searches now are voice search in the United States. But here's what's crazy. By, I think they said 2022, I think it's according to OCC strategy, uh, it's a consulting company. Around $40 billion is going to be transacted through voice search. That's a lot of money. Yeah. How many people are thinking about voice search when it comes to commerce? Very few people, right? Heck, very few people even think about voice search. Another trend that we end up seeing is right now, the biggest way to gain traffic isn't to just go out there and do what everyone else is doing. It's to translate your content and update your content. See, the majority of the world doesn't speak English, as you already know. But the majority of the content on the web is in English. So mm -hmm. translations provide a huge lift. And so does updating content because there's over a billion blogs. There's going to keep being more and more. There's eventually going to be, you know, blog for every single person. Right now, there's a blog for roughly every seven people in this world. That's one too many blogs. So Google has this prime pickings. Facebook has this prime pickings. LinkedIn has this prime pickings. If you update your content, you tend to do better in the long run because they want fresh, uh, content to rank versus old outdated information. Fantastic. The voice net search was actually one of the top things that I, I spoke about. Um, and I, I used that exact statistic as well. It was absolutely mind blowing. How, I think it's a $2 billion industry as of 2020 and then projected to progress to 40 billion, which is such a huge amount of growth. But do you, do you understand how, how it's, how it actually works on the back end? How, because presumably there's only going to be like one to three products, which are going to be able to, to meet the cut to actually get to the top. Cause if I'm asking Alexa, Hey Alexa, I want to, I want to buy a, a lawnmower to, to mow my lawn. And then how, how are we going to be able to get our products at the top of that search? I mean, presumably it's going to be paid. Uh, it could be paid, but it could also be SEO too, right? Uh, if, if you have the best reviews, the best products, the best listings, the best images, it all helps. So think about what you do for the organic approach. It also can help with the voice approach. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Okay. So for, for everybody listening, if you're selling products right now, and even if you've got for your clients as well, really be mindful of your client's SEO with regards to the, with the, the SEO around their product pages. Um, and so they can... They can be future-proofed when it comes to voice search because this is going to be something that isn't going away. I think it was 55% of all American households are going to have some kind of, it's predicted again by 2022, to have um, some kind of voice search enabled tool such as a smart speaker in their home and so yeah that certainly isn't going another thing that people that we were talking about a lot of people get scared about is ai and the effect on marketers and a lot of people think that ai is built to take marketers away it's going to be it's going to eliminate all marketing companies out there and will all be obsolete uh, what's your opinion on ai and its influence on advertising right now yeah, AI just makes it where, look, it makes your job easier as a marketer. If something's been a, done a thousand times, why can't you program a computer to just do it for you and figure it out? So through machine learning and AI, things are going to get easier. Um, there's even companies out there that can create blog content for you through AI. It's not perfect yet, uh, but it could be a good start. So just when I look at all these little things, it'll add up and eventually we'll be in a place where we can automate a lot of stuff. Not everything, but a lot. 
Yeah, no, I, I feel exactly the same way. Are you are you using any tools at the moment with your advertising efforts with AI based tools? I had I used a tool called Adex, um, and I didn't get on too well with it. The the the, the, ad, the ads that it created weren't that great, which kind of drew the, drew the conclusion that maybe the technology wasn't advanced enough yet to be able to take creating audiences out of our hands completely yet. But yeah, are you using any tools which you've found that have worked well? No, I haven't found any that work well. We've tested a lot. We think it's a year or two away. Yeah. Okay. Sweet. And the the, the final thing that we spoke about with the future trends was interactive video as well um, and interactive yeah. video funnels. Because it's amazing to me how little companies are actually using interactive video and interactive uh, based content right now, uh, because essentially you can create well, as you will know, you can create entire funnels just within a singular video. For example, like a pet store could be advertising products. And at the start, you can choose whether you're a dog owner or a pet owner. And the whole video can pan out personalized to that individual person. Have you got experience with, with, with interactive videos? Have you used them in your own marketing efforts so far? We have. Uh, it works well. We've even gone further. We even do interactive chat. Uh, we do interactive, well, technically chat is interactive anyways, but uh, we do interactive emails. Did you know you can actually do a whole checkout process and searching within an email and you don't have to go back to a website. So we've done it through that as well. And we're taking a lot of different formats out there and seeing what we can make super interactive because there's no reason for people have to go out and just go do everything manually, right? Like there's no reason, uh, why you have to create a terrible user experience for that to click a button, go to the website and then do a search again and just go through it instead of it just being seamless and integrated, whether it's through video, email, whatever it may be, there could be a lot of personalization and interaction. And we look at interaction more as personalization because um, that's the whole goal. And when you personalize, we're seeing conversion rates go up. Amazing. What is the tool that you're actually using for uh, email, uh, interactive emails, or are you just doing that for your CRM? No, we built it custom for ourselves. Ah, okay, okay, nice. That's that's something that we've been looking at a lot. Is trying to to to. We one thing we changed in our emails is we in recent updates so people can choose when they want to receive the next email from us. So with our newsletter, say, hey, do you want to receive our next newsletter or our next email tomorrow or right now, uh, or do you want to receive it in a week's time? So that's something we've certainly been testing out, and we're seeing that. I mean, also when you have that kind of thing, it's then your emails are being flagged up green. So people are actually responding and interacting. So it's just healthy for your overall account. Um, and yeah, that's definitely something that if, you, if anybody is, is, is doing email marketing right now, absolutely uh, try and introduce some kind of interactivity to it. And Neil, your story is um, so inspirational to both myself as a marketer but as to so many people on this uh, on my channel who have mentioned your name before and you are one of the most requested names i've had to do an interview on my channel and so i'm really really honored to have you on here today i would love to know and i'm gonna get really generic here but i would love to know what neil patel's secret to success is what is your what is your secret to scaling up to the levels that you have, um, but not just in your businesses because you've created products which have filled gaps that other people haven't filled before you, but more so in your brand and your personal brand and the perception of your brand, which so many people have huge amounts of respect for you within the marketing field. What do you think it is which has enabled you to grow so big? Two things, focus. You gotta focus on one niche, one vertical, one sector, whatever it may be. And two is persistence. If you just keep at it and you really just keep at it and you try to fine tune and get better and grow, you'll get there. Like I've been doing this since I was 15 and a half. I'm 35 right now, right? So roughly 20 years. So when, when you think about it, persistence and focus can get you there. Just everyone looks to get the results within a year, five years. Give it 10, give it 20, see what happens. 100%. People, I, I've forgotten who said it, people underestimate or overestimate what they can achieve in one year, but underestimate what they can achieve in 10. Are you a morning guy or an evening guy? Where do, when do you get the core of your work done? Morning. I wake up really early. Do you? How early? Uh, usually around 5.30. Amazing. Can you give us a bit of a rundown of your routine? Sure. Wake up, check emails, pick up my daughter from uh, her bed. Her, she wakes up around 6.30, 6, 6, mm. 6.30, somewhere around there. Uh, bring her to my wife baby so she has to feed her uh probably too many details there but uh <laughs> from there uh you know 
brush workout, more emails, calls, meetings. Uh, every so, once in a while, I'll blog throughout each day. But that's it. It's mainly that's, that's it's interesting. Mainly that's, it's interesting, sorry to interrupt you. It's interesting that you said that you check your emails first thing in the morning because so many other people say, never check your emails first thing in the morning. And I, I try and stay away from it because I find that my to-do list then doesn't get done because whatever has come up on my email seems to be more important to me then. So are you, are you, I would presume you've got like a, a inbox which is only really important things or how do, you, how do you allow yourself to not get distracted by everything that you're seeing first thing? I have multiple inboxes. I manage one of them. My team manages, I think, three or four for me. Okay, okay. So you're only seeing the really important stuff. Eh, you'll be shocked on how many people subscribe me to the newsletters that I have no clue who they are. <laughs> but in general, my email volume isn't that bad. I probably go through 150 to 200 a day myself. Oh, amazing. <laughs> yeah, that's, 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 that's respectable. Okay. <laughs> 150 emails. I think I'm hard done by by going through 30 or 40 emails in a day. And I'll complain that that's too many for me to go through. So I probably need to take some slack off the PA and bring some back to me. Um, Neil, th th thank you so much for, for doing this interview today. I'd want to just round off by a quick fire question. And you can just tell me uh, off the top of your mind, which of uh, which of these comes to your mind? Because you probably got obligations in all of these platforms. But I want to know, what is Neil Patel's favorite advertising platform right now? Google. Google. Okay. Yeah, keyword base. It's easier to convert. Facebook is great too. I'd pick that as my number two. But I love Google. Everyone says it's expensive, but it still works and drives a ton of traffic. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And, and not enough people. This, this, it's really strange that... All of a sudden, well, not all of a sudden, but Facebook has almost taken, uh, in, in the perception, in the mind of new marketers anyway, Facebook is seen as like the holy grail. And it's like Facebook, Instagram, that's all we do. And in so many cases, companies are not even new companies anyway, are, are, are kind of overseeing or overlooking uh, Google because they think that Facebook and Instagram, because they've been pushed so heavily in the latest years, have, they think that it's so much better and it couldn't be further from the truth because with Google, uh, for anybody that hasn't used a Google advertisement platform, you're getting, essentially you're getting inbound leads into your business. Okay. With Facebook, we're putting our products in front of people with Google. We're essentially relying on people searching and then finding us. And we're, we're paying to get ourselves at the top of rankings again for then YouTube ads as well, which are, it's just a different kettle of fish, but um, yeah, I, I want to round this interview up, Neil. So thank you so much uh, for coming on today. Uh, I really, really appreciate it. And I hope everybody else has got a ton of value from this video. Be sure to check out Neil on YouTube. Neil, is YouTube uh, from the most active place you're putting out content right now? YouTube or my blog, either one. Okay, fantastic. Guys, I'll put a link in the description. Go check them out. And again, thank you, Neil. I hope you have a wonderful day wherever you are in the world right now too. Thank you. Cheers.